Okay, let's go ahead and start section 4.2, exponential functions. And we're going to discuss the meaning of some real number b raised to a fractional power m over n. Um, and this is something you may have already known, but if b is a real number, then b to the m divided by n is equal to the nth root of b raised to the mth power. There might be an easier way for you to remember this. So let's look at b raised to the m over n. Well that's equal to b by the law of exponents to the 1 over the nth power all of it raised to the nth power. And what's in parentheses here, b to the 1 over n is the nth root of b. Sorry, that should be an m there. All of which is raised to the nth power. So that's usually how I do it because it's easy for me to remember b to the 1 half is equal to the square root of b and b to the one half <coughs> to the third of course would be the same as b to the three halves which would be the square root of b here I'm explicitly writing the ind index raised to the third so basically this entire lecture is going to be on exponential functions so until this point basically the exponents that we've had are real numbers that have always been rational numbers that's fractions whose numerator and denominator are integers and of course the denominator is never zero but we want to define a function and in particular we want to find a function we want to define a function like this f of x is equal to b raised to the x power. And we want the domain of that function to be all of the real numbers. Since there are a lot of real numbers that aren't rational numbers, we have to extend the exponent x to allow it to be irrational. And basically, mathematicians just do it magically and they say, okay, now it works. Uh, in a graduate math class, you would actually see the proof of how that works, and it's actually quite fascinating. It's uh, an important theorem in the discipline called analysis. So exponential functions, like f of x is equal to b to the x, where b is a positive number, are called exponential functions. And I've already put up for your web page an addendum on COVID-19 exponential functions and I will require you to watch that and there will be some questions uh, that you want to look at uh, before the next canvas portion of your next exam on chapter four so this is just for you to do we're not going to do it now but I kinda want you to get some idea of the difference of these types of functions so y in other words f of x is equal to x squared that's a polynomial function. That's not an exponential function because the exponent is constant. It's 2. Whereas y is equal to 2 to the x. In this case, the exponent is a variable, and that is an exponent. Uh, sorry, that is an exponential function. So if you go to a place like geogebra.com or geogebra, sorry, .org graphing, if you've got your notes up or you pull your notes up on a computer then you can just click on that link and you can explore with comparing the big difference between the graph of y is equal to x squared and y is equal to 2 to the x. You should also experiment with other settings <coughs> where you have y is equal to a b raised to the power of a times x <coughs> excuse me for different values of a and b for example y is equal to 1 half times to the 5 times x power or y is equal to 4 raised to the x divided by 3 power. The more you experiment and use computers to experiment, 
the more you get a mathematical intuition of what's going on. So <clears throat> let's look at some additional properties of exponents and exponential functions. So if we have any real number a that is greater than 0 but not equal to 1, then the following statements are true. a raised to the power of x is a unique real number for every real number x. And what that tells you is that y is equal to a to the x can be considered as a function f of x is equal to a to the x, whose domain is every real number b. This is going to be a very important property. Notice the base is a, the exponents are b and c. So a raised to the power of b is equal to a, the same number, raised to the power of c, if and only if b is equal to c. Uh, the explanation is that f of x is a one-to-one -one function. And if f of a, I guess in this case, if f of b is equal to f of c, that implies a to the b is equal to a to the c. That means b is equal to c. From our definition of a one-to-one -one function and how we proved it. Some more important properties. If We're not going to worry about this right here. But if a <clears throat> is always greater than 0, but it's not equal to 1, if it's equal to 1, then it's a constant function, and it's not a 1 to 1 function. And we want to deal with the case when they're 1 to 1 functions. So if a is greater than 1, then f of x is equal to a to the x is an increasing function. If a is between 0 and 1, not including 0 or including 1, then f of x is equal to a to the x is a decreasing function. And those are things you can also experiment with when you're in GeoGebra. Uh, choose a base value of a that's greater than 1 and plot, for example, 7 raised to the x power. Then choose something that's between 0 and 1, like 1 fifth raised to the x power. And you can see that in one case the function is increasing and the other case the function is decreasing. And here we have the formal definition of an exponential function. So here I've switched the base to the variable b. Uh, the book uses the variable a. Uh, they're really not variables, I should say the constant b because the variable is x. The constant b, the book uses the constant a. Uh, B stands for base, but it doesn't matter. They're just choices of letters for constants. So you shouldn't have any much of a problem with that. So let B be greater than 0, but not equal to 1. Then the exponential function to the base B is defined to be f of x is equal to B to the x. And what I don't tell you here is that the domain of this function is all real numbers. So here I give a mathematical reasoning question before we go to example one. So I want you to use the addition properties of exponents together with what we learned in the last section about one-to-one -one functions to give reasons why exponential functions are one-to-one -one functions. And I pretty much gave it away. But if I decide to put this particular reasoning question on our next Canvas-based exam, then I will put it up or something similar to it in our Piazza discussion board and let you all discuss it. In particular, what happens if we allow b be equal to 1? To be honest with you, if you review, I literally just answered both of those questions and some of the previous things I just said. So let's do an example. So our function is going to be f of x is equal to 2 to the x. And we're just going to get a feel of what this means by evaluating f at different values. So we're given that f of x, 
No, I don't want that. We're given that f of x is equal to 2 to the x. So we want to find f of minus 1. So just like all functions, I replace the symbol x with the input value of minus 1. And then I recall from our law of exponents, this is the same as 1 over 2 to the first power. In other words, to make a negative exponent positive, you move it across the division sign. So that's just equal to 1 half. So let's do example B. f of 3 is equal to 2 raised to the third power which is equal to 2 times 2 times 2, which is equal to 8. And f of 5 thirds is equal to 2 to the 5 thirds. So I'm going to come over here. So by what I said before, that's the same as, let me erase this. Actually, I learned how to make the eraser bigger right before I started this and turn off the eraser. That's equal to 2 to the 1 third power raised to the fifth power. That's just by the law of exponents. And what's in parentheses here is the cube root of 2 and the cube root of 2 is raised to the fifth power. And we're not going to bother to evaluate that. So that's just basic playing around with functions uh, that are exponential in nature. So here are some mathematical reasoning questions that you have to go through and look at each one of these and answer the questions. I'm just going to answer a few of those and let you answer some of the others. And I will post this on our discussion board uh, because I will guarantee these properties will be used again and again and again. And as you will discover, if you've not already, when you take the Canvas-based exams, there's not an awful lot of calculation for you to do, but rather we're focusing on those in the area of mathematical reasoning. So let's look at the first one. Let me bring up my whiteboard here. Move us and get us some more space. So we're given, again, that f of x is equal to b to the x. And this is an exponential function. Hence, I know that b is greater than 0 and b is not equal to 1. And I also know the domain of f is minus infinity to infinity. None of those matter right now, but it's always kind of nice to remember when you're putting together pieces of a puzzle this fact right here, that b is greater than 0 but not equal to 1, might play a key role later on. The fact that the function's domain is minus infinity to infinity might be exactly the reminder you need to answer another question later on. So let's find f of 0. So f of 0 is equal to b to the 0th power. And I'm assuming you remember that since b is not 0, why? Because b is greater than 0, that is equal to 1. So that leads to the next question. And literally, if we think about it, we just answered it. What is the y-intercept of, of f of x? Well, the y-intercept is always the point where x is 0 and the function value is f of 0. And literally, you have everything you need right here to fill out that point more completely. When x is equal to 1, what is the value of x, f of x? That's really easy. 
when x is equal to minus 1, what is the value of f of x? So let's go over here and evaluate f of minus 1. That's equal to b to the minus 1. That's a negative exponent. I don't like them. To make it positive, I just move the base and the exponent across the division line. And b to the first power is just 1 over b. So when that tells you that the point minus 1 and 1 over b lies on the graph of f of x equals b to the x. What happens to f of x as x gets smaller and smaller? And this is the hint right here. Because here I have a negative value of x. It's minus 1. And what happens? It becomes a fraction where b to the power, which is this case, minus 1, becomes 1. So f, give you a hint here, f, so assuming x is positive, then f of minus x, means minus x is less than 0, is b to the minus x, which is equal to 1 over b to the x. So b now, being greater than 0 but not equal to 1, is the values of x get larger and larger. In, in this case, the values of minus x are getting smaller and smaller in the negative direction which means 1 over b to the minus x, which is b to the x, gets larger and larger. That means as x goes to minus infinity, gets larger and larger in negative values, f of x goes to the value 0. Okay, what does that tell you? Well, I ask it in the very next question. What is your answer to E tell you about the existence of a horizontal asymptote for f of x? What is the equation for the horizontal asymptote of f of x? What is the domain of f of x? I just told you that. What seems to be the range of f of x? So for this one, let's actually go over to GeoGebra. And let's actually do uh, 3 to the x. Here we go. So that's its graph. And as I get out, you can kind of see what happens as x gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It approaches the x-axis. The x-axis has equation y is equal to 0. And as the values of x get larger, f of x gets increasingly large really fast. It's called exponential growth. So that graph, looking at the graph, tells us that f of x, its range should be, let me pull this up. So it tells us what we know the range of f of x equals b to the x when b is greater than 1 seems to be by the graph zero infinity. So you should actually find the range of f of x when b is between the values of 0 and 1. And you'll find it similar to this, uh, but there's some important changes. Does f of x ever cross its horizontal asymptote? So we want to figure out j algebraically. And pretty much what we did before 
If its horizontal asymptote is y is equal to zero, then what we've been doing is we want to discover the following. Does it cross its horizontal asymptote? We tried to solve the equation y is equal to zero, y is equal to b to the x. So is there any value x when I raise b to that power that I get zero? And you're going to have a really good intuition that the answer is absolutely not. But we're kind of coming about that by what's known in mathematics is analysis, analytical reasoning. Where this is an algebra class, so we kind of want to have an algebraic reason as well, and we will get one soon. Um, so let's look at the characteristics of the graph of f of x is equal to a to the x. So here notice that they've changed the base to the constant a, and I was using a constant b, b to stand for the constant, and they're using the letter a to stand for the constant. And if you really went through and answer all the questions on the previous page, everything, every point here will already be known to you. So use the above information and a table of values that includes values of x in the set minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2 to graph f of x is equal to 1 fifth to the x. So I'm going to let you all do that with GeoGebra. I'm, I might not start you out, but I do want to show one thing that's really important in this particular question, and that we're going to use it again. So we're going to use the exponent laws here to simplify the right-hand side of this equation. So we're given that f of x is equal to, in parentheses, my base is one-fifth to the x power. So using exponent properties. That's the same, I think it's the quotient rule. That's the same as 1 to the x over 5 to the x. But 1 to any power, x is 1. So that's the same as 1 is 5 to the x. So for example, if we're going to do a table of values, and that's my x value, and this is f of x is equal to 1 over 5 to the x. And my input is minus 2. Then 1 over 5 to the minus 2 is I'm going to get rid of this negative exponent by moving it across the division line. And that's the same as 25. So the point minus 2 and 25 lies on the graph. Well, what about the point 2? Well, then that's 1 over 5 to the x, which is squared, which is 1 over 25. So another extreme point is when x is 2, f of x is 1 over 25. So you're going to see that when b is less than 1 but greater than 0, that this is a decreasing function. And its graph will look something like this. I mean, you can graph this, and I really want you to do some experimentation. Uh, I'm absolutely perfectly fine that you do some exper experimentation. But its graph would look something like this. Of course, it's getting closer and closer. So let's move on. I'll let you graph those on your own. If you've, I literally gave you 
enough of this sheet that you can graph it on this sheet. And it's pretty easy. Pretty much this is an exercise of evaluating this function at one, two, three, four, five values and then plotting the corresponding values on the graph. They're going to be really far spaced, to, spaced apart quite a bit and uh, you can kind of see I mean one's going to be way up here at m minus 2, um, 25. The next is going to be at minus 1, 5, etc. But you can play with that later on. So here we have we're going to be solving exponential equations. So the first thing I want to do is I want to show you uh, that an, expo an exponential equation, of course, is an equation. We're going to have equal signs. I feel like I'm on the news and I'm going through my news notes here. But I want to make sure I, when I write down my notes, I sometimes prepare additional facts that I want to tell you all. And I think I have one on this page. So I want to make sure I don't forget it. So an exponential equation. So W is going to stand for a degree one polynomial. Of course, the constant value is also a polynomial. But um, a degree one polynomial, I mean, we might as well say it's in the variable x. For example, x minus 2, or x, or 5x plus c 7. And let c and b both be greater than 0, with b not equal to 1. Then the constant c is equal to b to the w, is an exponential equation. In this case, w is an expression. It's a polynomial in the variable x. And that's where our uh, x comes in. So let me give you some examples here. For example, 8 is equal to 3 times the 2x. That's an exponential equation. 1 is equal to 4 times the times raised to sorry raised to the power x minus 1. Both of these are exponential equations in the form c is equal to b to the w where w is a degree 1 polynomial. In this case w is the degree one polynomial equal to 2x. In the second case, w is the degree one polynomial polynomial equal to x minus one. So let's actually solve a exponential equations. So we're actually going to use the fact that exponential equations are one-to-one -one functions. So <coughs> since exponential equations are one-to-one -one functions. If the input value is s, then b to the s stands for f of s is equal to b to the r, which is the second input value, r. Then since they're one-to-one, -one, we have to have s is equal to r. So let's go ahead and solve. This looks like a really hairy equation. And if you've never seen it before, you will have no idea what to do. But I will show you it's really not bad at all. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do, i got to hit the right thing, 1 over 3 to the x is equal to 81. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to transform this using just the property I just said. This is the same as 1 over 3 to the x is equal to 81. So now I want to write 81 with the same base. Because if b to the x is equal to b to the r, then x is equal to r. So I need the same base. Well, 81 is equal to 9 squared. But 9 itself is equal to 3 squared squared. 
So 81 is equal to 3 to the fourth. So over here I have 1 over 3 to the x is equal to 3 to the fourth. So what I need to do is move my base 3 up above the division line. But I can do that using the exponent rule. I can move it up above the division sign. X becomes negative. I'm just putting the division line there and the one underneath just so you can understand what I'm saying when I say move it above the division line. So this is equal to, let's get some more room here. So this is equal to 3 to the minus x is equal to 3 to the fourth. So here remember if b to the r is equal to b to the s, then r is equal to s. Well 3, our bases are the same, they're both 3. So that tells me minus x is equal to 4, which implies that x is equal to minus 4. So let's recap what I just did there. Basically, I rewrote the equation into this form. Again, just using an exponent rule. And then I thought, okay, the base here is 3 to the x, so I need to somehow express 81 with a base of 3, and it turns out that was 3 to the fourth. But my base on the left-hand side is below the division line. I need it above, so I used an exponent rule to move it above the division line. The price I had to pay was the x becomes minus, but then the end result was it was a form which I could actually solve using the property given right here. And this property literally is a direct result of the fact that our exponential functions, since they're increasing or, de or decreasing functions, and they both pass the horizontal line test, are one-to-one -one functions. So let's see, is that it for this page? So now let's solve this one. This won't be too bad. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a challenge. At this point, you should pause the video and uh, you should try to solve this one on your own. So as I said before, on the one side, we have 2 to the x plus 4. All of that is an exponent. If you want to put parentheses around it, you can. And 8 to the x minus 6. So our goal is to write 8 in the base of 2. But 8 is equal to 2, whoops, not 3, but rather 2. to the third. So I'm going to make that change. 2 to the x plus 4 is equal to 8, I'm going to write as 2 to the third, put it in parentheses, that's what 8 is, and it's raised to x minus 6. Now we have an exponent rule that says b to the nth power raised to the nth power is equal to b to the n times m. And we're going to be using that rules an awful lot. So if you don't remember your exponent rules, you need to have them handy. You're going to be using them a lot and um, you've got to have them memorized. So this is not, the left hand side is not going to change. But this is equal to 2 raised to the 3 times the exponent x minus 6. Now how nice is that? My bases are the same. They're one-to-one -one functions. 
So this implies x plus 4 is equal to 3 times x minus 6, which is simple to solve, no, no problem. So that means x plus 4 is equal to 3x minus 18. So 18 plus 4 is equal to 3x minus x. 22 is equal to 2x. So dividing both sides by 2 gives me 11 is equal to x. And that's our answer. Okay. So this is a retake of example number 6. And we have the problem is x to the 4 thirds is equal to 81. And if you recall in a previous problem, we found out that 81 is equal to 3 to the 4th power. And over here I want to remind you of something. If x to the 4th power is equal to 81, then x is equal to 3, or x is equal to minus 3. This is because of the same reason we learned earlier, that if x squared is equal to 25, x is equal to 5 or minus 5. But notice that x to the fourth power can really be written as x squared squared. And that's true of any even power. So if we are dealing with a variable raised to an even power, we have to remember that the answer is going to come in two forms, a positive and a negative answer. That will basically uh, come into play here in just a second. So I'm going to go ahead and write this as x to the 4 thirds is equal to 3 to the 4th. And notice our numerator, 4, and the power over here is the same. So let's rewrite this x to the 4 thirds is x to the 1 third using exponent properties raised to the 4th power. And that's equal to 3 to the 4th. And here's my suggestion. You don't have to do this. But I'm just going to say let's let w equal x to the 1 third. So I'm going to rewrite this as w to the 4th is equal to 3 to the fourth, and that implies that w is equal to 3 or minus w is equal to 3, for the same reason is over here. But w is equal to x to the one-third, so x to the one-third is equal to 3. I need to find out what x is. So I'm going to raise both sides to the third power. That gives me x is equal to 27. So that's case number 1. And case number 2 is minus x to the 1 third is equal to 3. So I'm going to raise both sides to the third power, and that's going to give me minus x is equal to 27, or x is equal to minus 20. So here is a little spiel about money always comes into math. Uh, we have a formula for simple interest. It's called I is equal to PRT. Well, P is the principal amount you invest. R is the interest rate 
And T is the time in years. The unit is years. So let's suppose that you don't spend the interest and it's added by the financial institute to your principal after one year. So T is equal to one because it's after the one year. Then we have our original amount, the principal we invested, plus some P times the interest rate, which can be written as, once I pull out the P, is P times one plus R. Now suppose we just leave that amount in a bank and we invest it again. My new principal is P times one plus R, and I add to it my rate times the new principal, but that's just equal to P times one plus R, plus P times one plus R, why? Because since T is equal to one, because one year has passed. And I can factor that as P, I can pull out one plus R, that's one plus R times P plus I'm factoring out P times one plus R. So that's P times one plus R times one plus R times one plus R is equal to P times one plus R squared. Actually, when I, I do this for you in a bunch, I'm just gonna leave it right there. This is done for you much better in the addendum to this particular lecture uh, on COVID-19 uh, exponential growth. It's much easier. At any rate, continuing on that way, we have that we get a formula for the balance in your account after t years at fixed interest rate r. And it's given a is equal to p times 1 plus r to the teeth power. Uh, the book makes a typo here or something. Uh, so um, you're not going to read the book anyway, but they do. They, they state this is the interest or something, I remember, but it's actually the amount you have in your account. So we're going to generalize this formula to compound interest, and this is going to be our new formula. So the compound interest is given, that's the, the, the amount you have in the bank. If you invest a principal amount of P, at an interest rate R compounded n times a year, then after T years, there's my T, the account will contain A dollars given by the formula. A is equal to P times one plus R over N raised to the value T to the N. So this is a exponential function in the variable t because n is fixed, r is fixed, p is fixed, t is what varies. So here's my lexical spiel kind of giving you a heads up. In this chapter from here on out to the very end, calculator use is okay. There's no reason to go out and buy a calculator. Your calculator should not be a graphing calculator. It doesn't matter. You at, you're at home. You're going to be taking tests using my math lab. I'm not going to see you. But don't go out and buy something. You can use, if you're using Windows, you can use the standard calculator. Put in scientific mode. Um, you may not, you may know I don't use Windows. I use Linux in the form of the Ubuntu distribution. And this is their calculator and I can switch to basic mode and then to advanced mode. Windows Calculator says something very, very similar to this uh, where the advanced mode is called scientific. And you're looking for an E key. I don't know if you can see this or not. I don't think I can make it any better, bigger. No, nope, not the buttons. Uh, X to the Y, a log, and an LN key. That's what you want. Uh, these are some common symbols. Log, 10 to the X, LN, E to the X, Y to the X, 
or the x root of y. Uh, we'll be using a calculator for a few of these today. So suppose $1,000 is deposited in an account paying 4% interest per year compounded quarterly. Quarterly means four times a year. So A, find the amount. Since I used a calculator on this, I want to get my notes. Find the amount in the account after 10 years with no withdrawals. B, how much interest is earned over the 10-year period? Use interest earned is equal amount in bank after 10 years minus the original amount. That's all, almost a no-brainer. So just a little bit of... So we're going to be using the function The, the, you can call this a formula. A is equal to P times 1 plus R over N raised to T to the nth power. So in this case, P by our problem is $1,000. Our interest R is 4%. And you can write 4% is 4 over 100. Or you can write it as 0 0.04. That's 4 hundredths. And I think we're probably going to use this form. And there's going to be a reason. Our n value is how many times it's compounded yearly. And it's done every uh, four months. So n is equal to four. It's quarterly. And t is equal to 10. So literally, after this, it's just a calculator exercise. So we just fill in the formula values. a is equal to 1,000 times 1 plus I'm going to write my R is as 4 over 100 and that's divided by N which is also 4 and that's the reason I did that. My T value is 10 and my N value is 4. So I have to simplify what's in parentheses first so PEMDAS is into play so 4 divided by 100 divided by 4 is the same as 4 divided by 100 times 1 fourth, which is the same as 1 divided by 100. And that's raised to the 40th power. Still requires some simplification before I'm ready to use it in the calculator. So A is equal to 1,000 and 1 plus 1 over 100 is 101 over 100. You should be able to figure that out. Raised to the 40th power. So in your calculator, what you're going to do is, uh, let's do that. Uh, where is it? So what you're going to do is you're going to first, you're going to be using this function, y to the x. So the first thing you're going to do is I'm going to clear it. I'm going to find my uh, what's in parentheses. 101 divided by 100. And that's equal to 1.01. .01. Then I'm going to hit Y to the X button. And then I'm going to hit 40. And then equals. So that is 101 divided by 100 raised to the 40th power. And then I'm going to multiply that times, whoops, what did I just do there? No, it has variables, eh? Uh, make it go away. I just want times 1,000. Which you don't really have to do because you're multiplying it by 1,000. That means you just move the decimal three places to the right and you get a value 
of A is equal to 1,400 and eighty-eight dollars and eighty-six cents. So that's our answer to part A. Part B was how much interest did you earn? And that's simply calculated by the total in your bank after they added the interest minus your initial investment and that's equal to four hundred and eighty-eight dollars and 86 cents. Good. So some more calculations using interest. This is something you might literally use or double check when you get older and you start to buy a home or property or a car or anything or you have some money to invest. Anything that uh, requires a formula dealing with interest. So in this case, we have Becky must pay a lump sum of $6,000 in five years. So she's got to have $6,000 in her hand in five years. So what amount does she need to deposit today at a fixed rate of 3.1% compounded annually, that's just once a year, that will give a final amount after five years of six thousand dollars. And again, our equation is just going, we're going to just do part A first. We start out again with A is equal to P over one plus the interest rate over n times t to the n. And yes, if this were a class, you would have to have this formula memorized. So there's a bonus of COVID-19, huh? So in this case, what are we looking for? Our unknown is p. That is our unknown. What amount must be deposited? The deposit mount or the investment mount, the principal amount, all mean the same. That's our P. So what does she want to get at the end of five years? She wants, whoops, she wants $6,000. Our interest rate, this time I'm going to just write it as a number, 0.031. Remember, to turn a percent to a decimal number, we move the decimal one two places to the right. And of course, we would erase this decimal here and the percentage sign. Anyway, go back. No need to get that picky about erasing things. So now I want to erase that whole entire thing. So I'm going to do it. Just hold on. Okay. So that's our rate. She wants it in five years. So T is equal to five. And it's compounded annually. So n is equal to 1, and that's it. So let's fill in everything we have. So a is equal to 6,000. p is my unknown. 1 plus n is 1, so that makes it easy, 0 0.031. And our time is 5, and our n, of course, is 1. So what we need to do is continue on. It's really easy to solve, especially since you're using a calculator. So 1 plus 0 0.031 is 1.031. So what I need to do is use my calculator and find the value of 1.031 
raised to the fifth. I don't have to do that right now. As a matter of fact, this is going to be some value. So I'm going to divide both sides by that value. So P is going to be equal to 6,000 times 1.031 raised to the fifth. And that is equal to P, and that's what we seek. In this case, um, you all can do that and practice on your calculator. That gives a value of P equal to $5,150.60. So if she deposits $5,150.60 at an interest rate of 3.1%, which is really high, but it's just compounded annually, so it's not so good, uh, then at the end of five years, she will have $6,000 and whatever it is she wants to buy for $6,000, let's, let's hope if inflation has not skyrocketed or raised the price. But she's only going to have $6,000, and if it costs more than $6,000, she's in trouble. Okay, so let's do the problem B part. So if only 5,000 is available to deposit now, what annual fixed interest rate R is necessary for a final amount of $6,000 in five years? So now our unknown is R. So again, we start out with the equation. A is equal to P times one plus R over N raised to the nt, where n is equal to 1 and t is equal to 5. And we're given p is equal to $5,000. She still wants a to be 6,000. And our unknown value is r. So let's go ahead and replace in. a is equal to 6,000 is equal to 5,000 times 1 plus r raised to the fifth power. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to divide both sides by 5,000. In doing so, I have 1 plus r to the fifth power. So let's simplify that. So 6,000 divided by 5,000, we can just take off a lot of zeros. That gives me 6 fifths is equal to 1 plus r to the fifth. So what I'm going to do to solve for this is I'm going to raise both sides to the one-fifth power. Doing so gives me the following. Let me give some more room up here. This side is the same as the fifth root of six-fifths. Now, 1 plus r to the fifth raised to the 1 fifth is just equal to 1 plus r. And remember, I'm solving for r. So r turns out to be equal to the fifth root of 6 divided by 5 minus 1. And that is equal to r. And literally, I mean, if we were doing this in class, I would be happy with this answer right here. Uh, but when, we, when I did this in, uh, I used another program. I didn't use a calculator for, for this. I got the R, so you can use this to check your answer. So this is something that you gotta do in a calculator. You have to calculate the, the fifth root of six fifths. 
So what we would do in this case, using this calculator, I would divide 6 by 5. Now I would raise that to the power of 1 divided by 5. And then I would subtract 1 from it. And you're going to get your approximate answer equal to 0 0.0371. And to turn that into a percentage, now you just do the opposite. You move the decimal two places that way. So that's going to be equal to 3.71%. Good luck finding that. Um, let's go on. So here is a new mathematical constant. So we're going to consider the formula for the amount earned after one year. This is just compound interest. But our t value is 1. So the t goes to 1. So it's a is equal to 1 plus r over n to the nth power. So suppose we wanted to compound it twice a year, three times a year, 100,000 year, etc. This is the same as asking what happens to a to the n power as n goes to infinity. It turns out that uh, in this particular case, uh, is the function is the value is the variable n goes to the infinity a to the n or y actually becomes a constant it has a vertical asymptote and it's not zero uh, the, Swiss, the Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler so you're hearing me say it uh, I said this Euler forever but it's Euler um, discovered that that value is an irrational number and he we refer to it as the constant E. We call it Euler's constant E. It's extremely important. Notice E is irrational so we can never write down all of its decimal places because it goes on forever and ever and ever and doesn't repeat. But E is approximately equal to this. Now if you have your calculator and it has an E function there, uh, you can raise it to the first power and it will give you an approximation of E that way. E raised to the first power is equal to E and it will give you an approximation. So this leads to continuous compounding and compounded continuously we have this formula. So if P dollars are deposited or invested at a rate of interest R compounded continuously for T years, then the amount A in dollars at a fixed rate R in time T is given by the formula A is equal to P times, this is a constant, it's like pi, that's what it's about, equal to E times R to the T. So remember E is a constant. It's not a variable. That's what E is about equal to. This is again a function of T and it can be uh, expressed as A to the T is equal to P times E to the RT. Anyway, another question. So this time we have someone who has $5,000 deposited and this time 3% interest is being invested. I want to find my, answer, my uh, worked out solutions to this one too. Um, and it's compounded continuously and find out how much money they will have in their account after five years. So again we have to remember a formula and our formula is the amount is equal to our principal times E times our interest rate times T. 
t. So p in this case is $5,000. Our interest rate you can either do 3 over 100 because 3 percent per cent means per 100 or you can write it is 0 0.03 and time is equal to five years. So now it's literally just a matter of plugging and chugging and using your calculator. So A is equal to 5,000 times E raised to 5 times 0 0.03 which is the same as 5,000 times e raised to the 0 0.15. So again, let's go ahead and do that with the calculator just so you can see. You thought you never get to use a calculator, right? So this actually has an e key. So I'm going to hit e, x to the yth power. And the power I'm going to raise it to is 0 0.15. Now I'm going to hit equals. So that's the value of E raised to the 0 0.15. And now I have to multiply that by $5,000. And I get an answer of $5,809.71. So that turns out to be $5,809.71. So that's more interest than she earned when it was compounded annually. So continuous compounding is a good thing. And let's go on. So we're just going to talk about this. Um, we'll set it up. I'll set it up for you. And there's a lot of zeros, and it's messy. I'll do one of them, and I'll let you all do the other. So there's a model for COVID virus growth. Uh, it's a little bit simpler than, th than this. But a function of the form f of t, so our input variable is t. Why? Because many times t stands for time. And we want to see how things grow over time. And with exponents or exponential fun functions, since E itself is greater than 1, we know this is going to be an increasing exponential function. These are so important in mathematics, in physics, and in models of the real world. But the function f of t is equal to y naught, that's a constant, times E raised to the kt for some non-zero constant y naught and k where y naught is usually interpreted to be the amount or number present at time t equals 0, and hence corresponds to the y-intercept of the graph, uh, models an awful lot of the real world. So we're going to do one last example, and I think we're almost to the end of it. So let f of t be 0 0.001942 times e raised to the 0.00609t. So y naught is this value right here. This is y naught. In that equation right there, this is my y naught. 0.00609 is my k value, and of course there is my t. That models the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million where the domain of the function is restricted. In this case, the domain has to do with values of t. So t has to be greater than or equal to 1990, but less than or equal to 2,275. So this, this model, they expect, will work for about 200 plus years, about 300 years. So we're asked to find the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million by the equation at the value of t is equal to 1990. Now if you look in the book, they don't use the equation I give you. They actually use something called a scatter plot. Uh, 
and we're not doing scatter plots. It's not. It's really interesting. You'll get to do them a lot if you ever take uh, stats. I suppose you'll get to do them in stats where you normally get to do them. But our function here is given to be f of t is equal to y not e to the kt, where y not is equal to 0 0.001942, and k is equal to 0 0.00609. So what we want is to find f of 1990. So we have to calculate 0 0.001942, that's my y naught value, times e raised to 0 0.006. Oh, 09 and my input variable is 1990 and this is my k and this is my t and when I do that I get and you can check now and see but your answer when you do that so let me maybe I should have not written so much there what you're literally calculating is F1990 is equal to 0 0.001942 times E raised to 0 0.00609 times 1990. That's my input value right there. So what you want to do is you want to calculate this first and you're going to get 0 0.001942 times E, unless I did it wrong, I don't think so because I had the computer do it for me, times to the 12.12 12 .12 power. So then you calculate you you raise e to the 12.12 power and you multiply it by 0.0, .0 you multiply it by this value and we can do that right now really fast. Let me clear it out. Where's my C button? So e x to the y value that's going to be 12.12 that gives me that number. And I'm going to multiply it by this really small number. 0, 0, 001942. I left off the leading zero. And I got 356.3 parts per million. Uh, unless I did that wrong, there could be some errors here. I think I actually got a slightly different answer because I input that exactly as what it was. This is rounded up to the nearest uh, one hundredth, and when I did that, I got about three hundred and fifty five parts per million. So that's something you would want to do on your own. Um, so let's see what else. I'm thinking that we are very, very close. Okay, I don't know what's going on. At one version of this, I actually proved algebraically this challenge up here at the very, very top. And in my change of Dropbox, in other words, we wanted to show, I'm not going to do it now, you don't have to worry, I mean, I'm done, you can turn it off, but what I wanted to do was prove that the function, algebraically, whoops, I hit the wrong thing, so I wanted to prove that
the equation z is equal to b to the x has no solution. And it used to be literally at the very end of this worksheet and it's gone. That means I must have had this worksheet up in two different places. It saved to Dropbox. I will redo it and add it because some of you might be interested in proofs because I was and that's actually what got me into mathematics as I was introduced to proofs uh, right at the very very beginning of my mathematical maturity when I was in high school and I took geometry and if you like proofs and you really really dig them you're a mathematician at heart at any rate this is the end of lecture 4.2 I hope you all are staying safe. You're not freaked out about COVID. It'll all end eventually. It has to. Um, and uh, I will talk to you either by email, by the office, virtual office hours or whatever. Keep studying and stay safe.